Booyah! It's cyborg time. What's up, everybody? Uh, once again, it's on with the Black Comic Lords. Uh, our next installment of our Black Comic Creators series, uh, focusing this time on cyborg. Now, I I personally we do a lot of these interviews. I personally think this is this is one of the more important characters to for us to do a study on. Um, when we talk about the DC universe and we talk about uh, who are the most important characters in the DC universe, I postulate to you this question. Who are DC, DC Comics A-list black superheroes? Now, before you answer, let's review some of the general criteria. Everyone's got different criteria as to what's considered an A-list character, but I think most people would agree on, on several counts. That the character be fairly well known, right? Like be um, known by the casuals, name recognition. Another criteria is having good history, you know, good number of books and stories behind them. Um, but I think uh, one of the other criteria is merch. Um, is the is the character on a lunchbox in a Halloween costume? Are there action figures? Uh, and finally, media. That's a big one. Is the character in a cartoon? Is the character on a television show? Is the character in a movie? Now, based on all those criteria I just gave, ask yourself again that same question. Who are DC Comics black A-list characters? The only character that I know of, and if, if I'm wrong, please, I'm not a, you know, I don't know everything. Let me know in the chat. But I believe Cyborg is the only black DC character that checks off every one of that criteria on the list. There are some characters that have been in cartoons, some that have been on television, but not everyone that's been on cartoons, television, movies, lunchboxes, action figures, statues, um, comic book history, um, the whole nine yards. Cyborg is pretty much it. He's more important than most people recognize. And quite frankly, in the hands of the right writer, his power set and possibilities for the character are virtually endless, right? We're going to talk about that with Cyborg's newest writer, Mr. Morgan Hampton. Um, Morgan is one of the participants of the Milestone Initiative uh, development program, which, which opened his doors to the first DC project that he ever got to do, where he got to write on the DC Power uh, anthology book. He did a story called Booyah that focused specifically on Cyborg. Um, but enough of me. Let's bring him on and uh, ask him what he has in store for us on this character. So with that, I introduce you all to Mr. Morgan Hampton. Hello. That was a great intro. <laughs> Not so. I did yeah. that on the fly. I just, I, you know, I didn't have anything like that. <laughs> um, hey, welcome. Thank you for having me. H have you done a lot of these interviews? I mean, uh, I have never done a live interview before. You've done never a done a live interview. Yeah, no. So let's, we'll see how nervous I seem. <laughs> wow. That's, that's like the second time this has happened. Maybe the third. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, we, the first one was uh, Sean Damian Hill. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Sean. Yeah, so uh, we were his first live interview too. We'll, we'll try not to beat you up as much as we did. Because <laughs> um, he hasn't called us back since. <laughs> I, I kid, I kid. We love you, Sean. Um, so you know, how? Tell us about your background. Tell, tell us uh, about yeah. yourself. Um, yeah. So yeah, grew up being a big fan of comics. I, I'd say comics is actually what got me into reading in general. Uh, yeah. I never had the the patience for just words on a page, and in comics, like the pictures got me into, you know, wanting to see what was going on in there and then ultimately became more of a reader and a writer. Um, I got my uh, BA in creative writing from San Francisco State University, 
currently pursuing my MFA from Loyola Marymount University. Um, and that program is in uh, television writing and producing. So, okay. And then, yeah, you mentioned the, the milestone initiative. I did that um, fall of 2021, um, right when I started my grad program. So it was, it was a rigorous thing to do at the same time of grad school, but I made it through and here we are. <laughs> I mean, you're, you... What a tremendous honor. You're part of the uh, inaugural class for the Milestone Initiative. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the amount of talent that's come through that class and the books that they've worked on. We've we've interviewed some of them. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are like the future. Yeah, right? no, I, I think it, we're all still kind of racking our heads around just the, the, the fact that we got to go through it and are now getting opportunities. Like, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, sure. like... I, I, for, for all of you who, are, who who may be watching this, understand these writers and, and artists, they're the future of comics. Uh, for, for those of you who are into spec, now's the time to get on on board with these with these creators and and get these initial books that they're doing because I promise you these very talented individuals five, ten years from now, they're gonna be hot stuff. And uh, don't be a fan later. That's all I have to say. Um, so uh, what you said you mentioned that you started, uh, you got into comics when you were trying to, you know, when you was a kid, learning how yeah. to read. I think that's a lot of us the same story. Yeah. Um, who were your favorite comic characters back in the day? Um, back then, I'd, I'd say this wasn't specifically a comic. I, I got into like the milestone stuff with, with uh, the Static Shock TV show. So that really? for sure was one of my one of my favorites growing up. Um, when I first started reading comics, I was just reading stuff from the dollar bins. I wasn't following any, you know, storylines or anything. Just, just whatever looked cool on the cover, I would pick that up. And right. my dad also had a lot of comics that I would, you know, take from him and read. Um, so when I first started out, definitely anything like Superman, Batman, Flash, Green Lantern. As I got a little older and started getting into the stories, um, like I said, Static, once I started out more Milestone comics, um, John Stewart specifically, Green Lantern, he was also on the Justice League show. I always thought he was cool. Um, and then I, I grew up on the Teen Titans TV show, too. So, you know, Cyborg, you know, that's what we're here to talk about and, and Beast Boy and, and all those guys. Definitely. It, it's, it's fascinating. You know, we, we do a lot of these interviews and... Um... And we just do a lot of discussions within our own spaces at Black Comic Lords. And one of the entry, we, when people talk about their entry points into comics, routinely people normally say cartoons. Yeah. You know, that's how I got into comics. I first saw the cartoon and then I saw the book on a shelf somewhere. When I was a kid, it was like a bodega somewhere. For other mm -hmm. kids now, I guess it might be, a, I don't know, bookstore or Walmart or something is how they get it. But um it's it, and that, let's go back to my initial uh discussion where i was talking about what makes an a-list character um mm -hmm. the fact that that you could see them in a cartoon or a television show and say hey i want to get more about that character and and and, and re pick up a comic book and read it um do you how, how big a fan are you of cyborg huge fan this is why like this opportunity I still can't believe that I'm here doing this because I was, um, you know, five, six years ago, screaming into the void online, talking about like how Cyborg has so much potential and he's never really doing much other than being in the backs of panels and stuff like that. Like, so it, it, it's a really cool full circle moment to be here, to be able to actually contribute to his legacy now and kind of do some of the things that I've wanted to see, at least in the comics. Cause I think he's a character that's been developed a lot more in, TV and film than he has, unfortunately, in comics, um, at least from a consistent basis. So to be part of that legacy now is it, it means a lot because I am, you know, first and foremost, a, a fan for sure. I forgot to mention and show this. These are all your classmates um, from the Milestone Initiative. Real talented group of people. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wish them all well. Um, but, but after this, you finish this program, and then, boom, you get your first gig. Yeah. You see comics. Cyborg Booyah. Uh, tell us about this story. 
it didn't feel like boom right away. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of us finished the program and we were like worried, like, okay, we don't know what comes next. Like yeah. this could be, this could be all we ever do. And we were all feeling, you know, a little nervous about that. Um, and one of the things they told us, you know, when we were finishing up is just, they gave us all the emails to editors and stuff like that and just said, reach out. Uh, even if they don't answer, like they'll see your email. Um, so I, I did that. I also had, had some self-published work that I put into a book last summer and I went to San Diego Comic-Con and passed around my book to anyone um, who would take it, any editor who would take it. And uh, what eventually happened is I, I worked with Marquis Draper, who's an editor at DC. Um, I reached out to him and asked him if he had any opportunities. And uh, he came to me saying, we're doing this DC Power thing. This was like in August of last year. And um, he said, we're doing this DC Power thing. And uh, he, he he liked what I had said about Cyborg because when we did the Milestone Initiative interviews before any of us, any of us got admitted, we had to interview uh, with, with a bunch of DC people. And they asked us, other than Milestone characters, what characters would we like to write for DC? And I, I guess I went on this long five minute, you know, soliloquy about Cyborg and all the stuff you're going to see in my book about how, you know, his, he has all this potential and stuff and how it hasn't really been reached. And he remembered that when I reached out and asked for an opportunity, he's like, I'd love for you to write a uh, cyborg story because I remember what you said during that interview. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Cause I didn't, I didn't really think I was pitching in that moment. I was just talking from, from the heart. Uh, but he gave me that eight page story and I ran with it and it was the same thing. I'm like, all right, I got this eight page story. This is probably the only thing I'm ever going to get to do. So I'm going to try and knock it out the park um, and hopefully it'll create other opportunities for me. And I guess it did uh, because he he ended up liking that. Um, and I got the series a couple months later, which I didn't know was on the table either. Like it was something he came to me out of the blue with. Um, but Booyah was a lot of fun to write for sure. So let's, let's see a question from H&H. &H. Uh, Morgan, did the Milestone Initial members get to meet each other or interact much or is this much more of a virtual experience uh it started out um as a virtual experience we all we all they divvied us up from like they grouped us with the writers and the artists and we all had classes basically that we would do every week where they were teaching us the fundamentals basically um f for the writers you know how to how to craft an eight page story and for the artists how to how to draw all the important things they need to, to do like splash pages all that stuff um and the goal of it was we were going to write a story um which is actually coming out at the end of this month as well, or the beginning of next month, they pushed it back in the DC New Talent Showcase. There's all the stories that we wrote during the Milestone Initiative. So you'll actually see all the first stuff we ever did before all the stuff that's coming out now. But yeah, it started off as a virtual experience because we were on Zoom um, every week, basically for our classes. And then about a year ago now, we we did a an in-person summit. Uh, they flew us all out to Burbank. Uh, I live in LA, so I just drove. Uh, and they gave us uh, hotel rooms and we did a, like a, a one week summit where they had a bunch of people from DC come in and and preach to us. Like, you know, Dennis Cowan, Reggie Hudlin, whole bunch of people every day was just talking to us and giving us kind of all the uh, the things to think about as we were launching into the industry. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Definitely an, an invaluable experience. Well, how was that uh, having, you know, literal legends it was crazy uh, to mentor you yeah it we went out to to bj's with dennis one day and it just like <laughs> that didn't feel real like this is dennis <laughs> cowan and we got to eat food with him it was cool I, both him and reggie just feel like real people you know i think that's what you realize once you start to meet people is everyone's just a person um and you know they're they're there first as a sounding board for whatever questions that we have and, and they really do believe in in our talent wholeheartedly so we wouldn't be here without them yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Bulio. Let's talk about your story. Let's see. James Tomlin, can't wait to read this. You spoke from the heart. Best kind of way to express your love for cyborgs. You already got a fan. You got a guy who's already waiting <laughs> to read that book. Uh, so this. We have Livewire. Yeah. Of all the characters you had to choose. For, and, and for those who I mean, I don't know, this is from the DC Power anthology, um, Booyah story that, that Morgan did. Um, why did you pick Livewire? I, yeah. I, have, I have a suspicion as to what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is. Okay. Suspicion, but I want to know why you picked Livewire. Okay. Yeah. I, I, well, one, I'll say off the bat, Cyborg unfortunately doesn't have too much of a rogues gallery to, to pick from personally. Right. 
So I was like, okay, is he going to be a Titans villain? I don't know. Um, so I actually went back and going back to that, that, that criteria you have for, you know, the, the A-list uh, uh, characters. I went back to the Superman animated series and I watched a bunch of episodes. Cause I'm like, that's that series. And in the Batman series, they're known for developing those, those villains and making you feel for them on a personal level. Right. So I was like, okay, what can I do? What works kind of opposite of cyborg? You know, I, I didn't necessarily want to do a tech thing because I, I have a thing about, you know, villains always being just the evil version of the hero that they're fighting. I think there is, there is something to say about that, but I, I think we see it a lot. So I didn't want to just do like a, a, a bad cyborg villain. Uh, and, you know, I think there it was something cool with Livewire where, you know, a lot like Cyborg, a lot like all these characters is a tragedy to her backstory. Uh, but she went a different way with it. But I think she does have redeeming qualities. And I, f I felt like it was cool. And obviously, power set wise, those two things really mesh, you know, with with um, her electrical power. So I, I thought it would just be interesting to explore her on a personal level and how her powers kind of offset um, Cyborg and, and, and what he was all about. And we get a cool punctual moment where both of those things kind of come to a head in the story. Um, was that at all what you were? That was guessing? that was a hundred percent textbook. The answer that I was thinking of. Cool. <laughs> all the characters that can really be kind of a foil for a guy who's yeah, you know, made out of metal is sort of computer based. Um, you have someone who's living energy. Yeah. You know, how to, it's one thing when you can use energy to power your systems to do all types of cool things. It's another thing when the energy is kind of living matter and you can't really manipulate that. Yeah. You know? um, I think it's an interesting power set to, to have up against him. Absolutely. So I thought that was brilliant to use that. Um, any possibility that we will see more of Livewire in your run? Um, not as I have planned out. Um, you know, I just I just have six issues, which is real tight. Um, it's hard to fit a really complete story in there with with but also having room for like little Easter eggs of other characters as well. I will say, like, if I ever get an opportunity to do more, yeah, I would love to to play with Livewire again because I think, you know, a lot of times in comic stories can feel like they're they're kind of one off existing in their own little thing, especially stuff like in DC Power, which is in an anthology. But I did kind of use that story as as a launching point into what I wanted to build for my series. So I definitely think there's room to bring her back if I ever get to do more. Uh, right. Yeah, she, she's not in what I have for the six issues. Frustrated Fan Sports ask, what about Jinx? Because Jinx is kind of like Cyborg's Catwoman. Yeah, no, I can see that for sure. Yeah, going back to, to the Teen Titans animated series, definitely yeah. in this time with when he was at uh, the Hive Academy and stuff, for sure. Another that. another character that has a, a really cool moment in I mean I know you only had like six pages in this Booya story, but um Cyborg's mother. I, I love this panel. Um just to read it out for those that might be looking on their cell phones. The victor I knew was never defined by what happened to him. He was defined by how he responded. That's who you've always been. But you're still in there and I still love you. You light the way for others like you like you to follow. That's who you've always been. It's why I love you so much. This, this, I, I love this moment because one of the things that um, I think backstage we're talking a little bit, and, and I think one of the things Cyborg is 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 too often defined by is is the tragedy of what happened to him, right? Um, and sort of mulling that over and, and not having a, adjustment and 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 his mother was the the one constant in his life of yeah. of that centered him and and centered his humanity um and i think he's 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 technically been around for what five years because i think he became cyborg at 16 is about 21 year run i believe right I think he's actually a little older than that he's a little older than that at least i don't know if there's been any like confirmation on that so don't quote me, I guess. But I, I'm definitely writing Cyborg closer to my age, and I'm 30. Right. Right. Because um, I mean, so he's, I, he's he's I, been he's been a superhero for a while. Yeah, I mean, I, I know there's all the all the different crisis events and consolidating of different universes and all that. But I mean, you look at someone like Dick Grayson, right? Who's the head of the Titans? I I definitely think he's in his 30s. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think all the Titans are at the very least in my mind at least late 20s i'll say yeah 
Well, we'll we'll talk about the the various iterations a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, one, I, I grew up more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy. I, I got into DC much more later, with the exception of of Batman, who I've always been a consistent fan of since I was a kid. Um, the 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 DC crisis events make my head hurt. Absolutely. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> I just it, it's hard for me to keep track of all. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that yeah. with regard to Cyborg. Um. Uh. So anyway. Speaking of origins, right? Um, which uh, cyborg has had several origins, right? Yeah. You, you've got the the this this original stories in the explosion. You've got one version where his mom dies in the explosion. You have another version where his mom is dies from what's assumably cancer. Mm -hmm. um, You've got uh, his father giving him tech that he was working on for a secret government project. Then you've got uh, the idea that it's alien tech and that he's got the motherboard, mother box in, in, his, in his chest at this point. Um, which origin are you going with? Is it one, multiples, or all of them? Yeah. I think going back to what I was saying with DC a minute ago, it's all kind of consolidated now. So, like, it is kind of a little bit of everything. Um, that's what Rebirth was, right? The DC Rebirth basically kind of, is everything. That's what, that's what Rebirth was. And then the whole, the new thing, the Infinite Frontier that they did a couple years ago. Right, I think right. That's, I forgot that's about the that. thing that acknowledges that, like, basically everything that's ever happened has happened. And everyone, like, remembers it, even though there's inconsistencies and stuff. Um, but I have this I have this double page splash in uh, in Cyborg number one where we kind of rehash the origin for any and for anyone who doesn't know his origin and we touch a little bit on all of that stuff. So obviously he's got he's still got the the apocalyptic boom tube technology which powers him and, and, and basically turns him into Cyborg. But we are also acknowledging that he was a Teen Titan that he was in the Justice League and then yeah his mom did die when in his accident um, that turned him into cyborg. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of everything. So this version, his mom died in the accident. Yeah, in the in the accident with the, with the boom tube. And he does have the, uh, the mother box. He does, yeah. Okay. All right, so with that being said, um, what are some of the, he's had a lot of interesting defining runs. Not, yeah. he doesn't have a lot of runs. He's yeah. had a good number of runs, but yeah. He's had some interesting stories that have sort of been uh, defining of the character, and yeah. I've, I've put a few of them up here on on the on the screen, whether it be runs or individual issues. Um, did you borrow from any of these, or? or yeah, um, I'd say I didn't really borrow off of. I didn't take any jumping off points story wise from anything. Actually, let me take that back. The one you have in the top left, the Tales of the Teen Titan, which was, yeah. I guess, Cyborg's like first solo outing, even though it's just a single issue, which is about his original origin story. Right. I took a lot. Of, I took dialogue from that, actually, because um, uh, a lot of this book, um, going back to what you said about um, his family and his dad specifically, like this book does deal with his relationship with his father. I feel like yeah. you kind of have to do that in order to get to a point where he can't overcome that. Um, so I took some dialogue from from that specifically, uh, quoting Silas Stone, um, and jumping off a little bit just about what what that accident did to their relationship. But other than that, I I didn't take anything from any any of the other stories. Um, I am a big fan of the David Walker run, and and yes. David is actually kind of like a like a mentor figure for me. I uh, when I first started in comics uh, self publishing, I, I reached out to him. I sent him like a cold email. Um, I was just like, hey, I like I like the work that you do. He was doing like Power Man and Iron Fist at the time. Right. I was like, I love all your work. Like, basically, how do I get to where you are? And he was nice enough to answer like the next day. And we've been uh, we've had a core since then. Um, but I didn't take anything specifically um, from that run for for what I'm doing. Like I said, maybe if I get an opportunity to, to do more, um, I could do that. But with what I have, those six issues are tight, and I wanted to tell something, do something that we hadn't seen before. Yeah, David Walker's run, in my opinion, has been the best run to date. I mean, yours just came out, so we'll see. <laughs> um, it's, it's sounding good so far. But um, to this point, yeah, David Walker's run was was my favorite run because I think you know, some people have issues with, with some aspects of Cyborg that I think David sort of went straight on and dealt with. 
Yeah. And he also expanded the character and expanded his power set um, for modern times. Uh, yeah. When you live in an information age of technology, um, this guy should be like crazy powerful. I mean, he should the world, be the guy. Yeah. He should be the guy in yeah. all, all intents and purposes. But we're going to talk more about that. Um, the most recent origin came from Cyborg Rebirth. Um, I think so, right? Because there hasn't been one for the. Uh, what was that last one you just mentioned? Not Dawn of Infinite, DC. Infinite Frontier. Infinite yeah. Frontier. I don't think there was a. I don't think there was a cyborg story in Infinite Frontier. Yeah. So I think this is pretty much the last origin story. Now, what was interesting about this? In this story, um, Cyborg learns something. He gets some information about uh, his father's impression as to what he is. When we talk about the theme of man versus machine, that's yeah. that's it's tired. I mean, everyone's done that. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Am I a man? Am I a machine? It's like, all right, come on. We've heard this a hundred times before. This one actually took it a little further, put a wrinkle in it by talking about the science behind it. You know, yeah. it in, in this in this run, his father, and I'm not gonna read it all here, but it's you know, check out the run. In essence, his own father said, Look, you know, I don't know. Did, did my son actually die in the explosion? And I reconstituted him into a machine. Yeah. And if that's the case, wouldn't that make him a machine more so than a man, or a machine playing at being a man? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it raises these sort of metaphysical questions, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. Which for someone like him who's always struggling with that, kind of blew his mind. Mm -hmm. um, is this a concept that you plan on touching upon in your run? Yeah, um, in a different way. Um, uh, cause I also agree with you that that conversation is very tired. Um, yes. Uh, but I do understand that it's something that the character needs to work through. Um, so I, I touched, I touched on it a little bit in, in, in the Booyah story in DC power. And I do want to expound upon it. I, I totally understand the argument from a scientific standpoint that you can make that like, yeah, I don't know. Is, is this guy, is this guy a guy or is he, is he all, is he all technology? But I think my view of the character, the way that I'm kind of, the angle that I'm kind of taking is that Cyborg is uh, disabled. You know, he's got, he's got, albeit alien, but he's got um, alien metal prosthetics. And I think the, the, the parts of him that, that make him human are still intact. His mind, his, his soul, he still has all those things. And I think what this story, what my story is about is, is, the balance of, of what that what the physical and what the internal feels like and, mm -hmm. and overcoming and accepting who you are after you've gone through a tragic um, experience like him. Um, so the, the goal is 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 for people to at least buy the fact um, by the end of my series that, that Cyborg is accepting who he is and won't be kind of having that internal struggle with who am I anymore, um, even though, you know, growth isn't always linear. Um, I do hope to kind of overcome that conversation by the end of my series. You know, that that debate and that that concept, um, that analysis is one that I saw really early on in my life. I, I'm a lot older than you are. <laughs> so I, 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 I've been around the block when it comes to comics and what have you, but also popular culture. When I was a kid, like really young, there was a show that was actually still on television um, that I used to watch my dad um, that really sort of was the precursor to Cyborg. And that show was a $6 million man. Um, for those of you who don't know, because you're not, you don't have gray hairs like myself, <laughs> the $6 million man was a story, um, was a television show in the early 1970s um that was based originally on a novel called cyborg by martin kaidin in 1972. so he was literally the very first cyborg they didn't call the show cyborg because it was such a new term they didn't think anybody would really get it yeah so they called him the six million dollar man because that's how much his parts cost to, to fix him which in 1973 was considered a lot of money um 
But in short, this individual, Colonel Steve Austin, was a test pilot and a former astronaut, went to the moon, um, who was in a terrible accident, crash, and he lost one of his arms, he lost an eye, and he lost both of his legs. I actually uh, read the book um, adaptation of this, and it goes into a lot more detail in the, in, in this, in the science of this. This is, Gordon says, I was a huge fan of The Six Million Dollar Man. I was a huge fan of Six Million Dollar Man. He was one of my favorite superheroes back in the day. When I think about my first superheroes that I was passionate about, Six Million Dollar Man was him. Um, now there has been Six Million Dollar Man comics the past 20 years. They, yeah, they still make them. Um, what was interesting in the very first episode, he has this moment, and, that, and that's what this picture on the left is, is showing. He has this moment where he, he just comes out of surgery he wakes up after his crash. The last thing he remembers is his plane crashing. And he's noticing he's got this, you know, he's lost an eye and he's got this, this robotic arm. And he rips away the flesh because his flesh, you can't tell. Look, when you look at the picture on the right, that's what he normally looks like. There's, it's not like Cyborg with, you know, the metal contraptions and, and what have you. Yeah. He, for the most part, just looks like a regular guy. And he's looking at his arm. And he's like trying to deal with the fact that he's now a cyborg and he rips the flesh, the, the plastic flesh off of his arm um, to, to sort of, as he's dealing with the debate of who he is. Mm -hmm. the, and So this is the same thing cyborg goes through in terms of that, am I a man, am I a machine? Which, what am I at this point? Yeah. Um, but here's the difference. The difference was two things. One, he looked like a man. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the parts. Trust me, I'm, I'm bringing this all into a circle. It'll all make sense in a second. <laughs> the other thing is, if you look in the second picture on the right, that woman was the bionic woman. That was his girlfriend. Um, she was a tennis star who was in a skydiving accident. And um, she lost both her legs. She lost an arm. And instead of an eye, she lost an ear. Hmm. So he used his pull with the government to get her the same procedure that he underwent so that she would also would become bionic, have these, you know, cybernetic parts. And, and the two of them became government agents, uh, Jamie Summers, correct. The two of them become, became government agents for OSI, which stood for the Organization of Scientific Intelligence or something like that. They're like a science CIA. Um, the point I'm trying to make is because he looked human, his girlfriend looked human, and they he had someone to relate to, right? Um, they, they I mean, she forgot him initially, but eventually she got her memory back. But the point is, he had the ability to be human mm -hmm. and not be as disconnected as Cyborg. Right. Um, and I think that's that's kind of like the missing link for, for Victor Stone. Right. Um, we talk about Victor's most noteworthy relationship, and it's with Sarah Charles, right? Uh, his his uh, his father's lab assistant, I think, is how she's most consistently portrayed. And you've got in some versions, you know, she's marrying this corny dude, right? Um, in another version, uh, she she really loves him, but but they're kind of trying to figure things out. You can feel your heartbeat and these tender moments, but mm -hmm. he ever he never can seem to get it together yeah. with Sarah Charles. Um, even when we get to um, your run, this is a picture from your run, it seems like they'd work something out, but then they broke up. Yeah. Are we going to get more story as to the two of them? Uh, a little bit. Um, I think a lot of it is in these panels that you're showing here is, is uh, going back to that consolidation thing we were talking about. I did want to include that they did have a past relationship. Right. And what I wanted to allude to um, with this series was the reason why it didn't work out was a lot of the stuff that we're, that we've been talking about with Victor is that he's been unable to overcome a lot of the things that he is working through, or he hasn't been able to work through a lot of those things. And that's causing his relationships, his personal relationships to strain. 
Um, and, you know, they're, they're still, you know, cordial with one another because they, they work together. Uh, she works with his father and all that, but the relationship did end, at least in my mind, because Victor's inability to kind of like work through his, his issues. Right. And, and it's like, that's one of the things that bothers me about Cyborg is they keep focusing hey, on Joe, these issues. So. It's like, you've been a superhero for a long time, dude. Like at some point the therapy should stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you should be able to move on. You're like one of the world's most powerful characters. And, and this is why I raised the issue with the, the six the six million dollar man, right? Um and and you know, who's that? What was that oh Joe Illich is in the house. Yeah. Hey, what's hey, up? Joe. Growth isn't always linear. That's real. That's absolutely absolutely. So you know, his, his the six million dollar man appeared human. He had a relationship with a woman who could understand him because she's went through the same thing. Um, I really think that's kind of what separated Cyborg from the six million dollar man because six million dollar man ultimately was a well adjusted guy, right? Um, and the reason I, I remember I told you, I promised you I was going to tie this all together, right? Mm -hmm. I we talked before about what you and I considered one of the best runs on Cyborg, which is David Walker's run. One of the reasons I consider this one, um, and here's some panels from his run from 2015. One of the main reasons I think this run is so important is because David Walker fixed one of those things that bothered me about Cyborg. Because he has all this technology. He has, it's been acknowledged he has nanotechnology, right? And with nanotechnology, you can literally, they use nanotechnology now to like do surgeries and stuff, right? So it stands to reason he should be able to regenerate his skin and human form and make him look more human. And that's what he did. It turns out Cyborg had the ability to make himself look human all along. And he literally says here, she's like, well, how come you don't uh, ever, She, this is Sarah, this is a version of Sarah Charles. And she goes, how come, you know, basically you don't do this all the time? And he's like, this is who I am, how the world knows me. I'm not, I'm not ready for anything else. He kind of makes this conscious decision. I don't want the world to view me like this. I'm a mon like I don't say a monster, but he's saying I'm a cyborg. This is how the world knows me. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not ready for the world to sort of see me as anything else. Right. Um there's a lot of there's a lot of psychology in that, you know. Yeah. I mean go ahead. I, mean, I wanted to get your opinion on 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 that concept. Yeah, I mean, there's also going back to that, like the 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 notion that Cyborg had his his future stolen from him. So I can understand, you know, with this accident, why he doesn't necessarily want to uh, portray himself in in the same way that he was before the accident, because he, he, for all intents and purposes, isn't that same person in here. You know, he he he's going through the, the, the motions trying to accept Cyborg, but he knows that he's not that same victor anymore um and i think it is a powerful choice to, to to stay looking the way that he does and and not just for him too because i think he's a symbol for for other people who are going through what he is going through um obviously they don't have powers that could open up tele teleportation you know uh and stuff like that but but he he he's he's a person who went through something traumatic and for all intents and purposes is 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 um disabled. And I think it's important for people like him to see that they can also succeed in whatever they want to do and that their disability the disability doesn't hold them back or shouldn't hold them back. Please tell me that there is at least a page or a panel or two in which what you just said is 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 like reiterated. Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's kind of my whole vision for the series. I it's think part of, it's part of Victor accepting this about himself um and and yeah that's 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 my vision for it because I, I also i have a disability as well um not like not like the six million dollar man where i'm you know a cyborg that you can't tell that i'm a cyborg but i have an invisible disability it's called hemophilia which is a bleeding disorder yeah uh you mentioned you are a marvel guy so uh think of wolverine how he has that healing factor and he can right. heal from absolutely everything instantaneously I'm the exact opposite of that. I heal from absolutely nothing 
none of the time <laughs> uh, without the assistance of medication. So uh, I'm definitely bringing my my sensibilities when it comes to having a disability to, to um, and adding that that layer to Cyborg in, in Victor's mindset as he navigates the world as well. It's it's so so. Let let's let's expound upon that a little a little further. Um, yeah. I read your book, and let's 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 get into your book because we talked about his past. Um, you got a lot of cool covers mm -hmm. for your first issue. Um, uh, your artist on this book is 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 Tom Rainey. Yeah, that 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 dude's a legend. He's been around since yeah. I was a kid. Like, I think I remember him in books in like the eighties and nineties. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, how was it working with someone who's a, a, a veteran in the game? It's really cool, like, and a little intimidating. Obviously, this is my not just like my first series. This is my first like full issue comic book I've ever written. So, like, it's it's very intimidating to be doing this uh, with someone who is a seasoned vet. But um, what I really appreciate about Tom and and what I actually haven't had too much experience with is um, Tom is someone that likes a lot of direction. Yeah. And in, 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 in my sh very short time in comics, I've always been told, you know, let the artist breathe, let them do their thing, um, which I tried to do with Tom in some of my first early drafts of stuff. And he's like, actually, no, you could be a lot more meticulous with me. He likes a lot of reference pictures and and uh, for, for some of the, the characters that we're creating and stuff like that. Um, so he's very hands on, which is which is fun for me. But also, like, I haven't I, I haven't been accustomed to that to this point. Um, but it's. It makes a collaborative experience a lot, a lot of fun. Frustrated fan says he's already ordered two of the covers. Which which covers did you order? Um, special shout out to the one in the upper left hand corner. It's by Edwin Galman. Um, another one, yeah. Young young hot artists that are out there right now. Tom Rainey's is the is the red one, the second one, the red cover and cover and the cover A. So he so frustrated order the first two we just talked about. Um, the yellow one is by. Jorge, Jorge Corona. Jorge Corona. Yeah. Um, that's Jorge the also re did the redesign for Cyborg. Um, did he? Yeah. All the all the all the new the new look that he has. That was Jorge. Yeah. All right. That's what's up. And then this blue cover is by the dude himself, who's out in Japan right now. Yeah. Shout out to Nicholas Draper Ivy, um, who's the artist on 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 Static Shadow Shadows of Dakota. Yeah. That's that's a, that's a dope one too. And then the one on the orange one, I'm not familiar with this artist. That's Jorge Corona too. It's just his uh his like sketches for the uh the his design variant. Yeah. Okay. So that's the stuff that I saw like when they were still tweaking what it was gonna look like. They sent me all that like in an email before they put it on the cover and stuff. It's pretty cool. Did you talk to did you talk to Jorge or or even Tom about what you wanted to see in the design? Um mm -hmm. It, it, the conversation was with Marquise, my editor, um, but not too much. Uh, the, the the one thing that we were both in line with, though, is that he was going to have clothes on because I think it's been so long, at least in the comics, that he hasn't. He's effectively been naked kind of for 40 something years. Right. Um, even though he looks cool naked, we wanted to put him in clothes. Um, and then, you know, I think they worked closely with trying to get that kind of like athleisure look, which I really I really like that a lot. And it fits. Uh, who Vic is personally. Um, and then, you know, the it, it, these are clothes that I want to wear. So whenever DC, you know, is is going to making this stuff, I want to be one of the first people to get the sweats and the jacket because I think it looks pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's also I, I liked what you what you said. Um, it fits as to who he is as a person because yeah. he defined himself as, as an athlete first more than anything else before his accident. And on top of that, from a very pragmatic standpoint, um, I don't imagine Cyborg being overly agile or flexible or what have you. So getting in and out of clothes might be a little bit challenging for him, you mm -hmm. know, his thighs or what have you, and um, just ripping the clothes apart. So having athletic clothes would seem yeah. to be the most pragmatic type of clothes for him to have. Definitely. So I thought that was that was a cool concept. So here's 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 the the first sort of character that that kind of pops up to me. Um, Max, right? Um, the first panel that we have here to the left, that's actually from your, your Booyah story, where we first meet Max. Mm -hmm. And I see he's got behind his ear, is that a cochlear implant? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, okay. Um, so so 
he also has a disability to go with the theme that you talked about before. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that I don't think is, is there has been a few runs that talked or at least uh, not directly on it, but touched upon the fact that from, you know, oftentimes, you know, the black comic boys would think of him as a black superhero, but from another subset, he's also a disabled superhero or just differently abled superhero. Yeah. Um, and, and, and for a lot of people that that can be very symbolic. Yeah. Um, um, if you're a paraplegic or you've missed a limb or, you know, have some other type of disability, he, he could be a, a tremendous symbol. And, and I thought this was kind of a, a very unique way, subtle way to show that point by having him bond with Max with his cochlear implant and then having him pop up again in, in your newest run, which is over here on the right. And Max is like, oh, that's my boy Cyborg. Yeah. And I go back. <laughs> you know. DC power. Um, we've got these two other characters. What is his name? Gigi and Mammoth? What's it? I always get the guy's name wrong. Oh, Gizmo and Mammoth, yeah. Gizmo yeah. and Mammoth. Yeah. Uh, are sort of comic relief. Uh, are they going to be major characters in your run? Uh, I won't say major, but they do pop up again. They pop yeah. up again? And they're definitely comic relief because they're a little goofy, right? Like, yeah. Um, uh, that goes back to just like, you know, I'm dealing, we're dealing with some heavy stuff in, in this book, but I do think it's important to have levity, especially in comics, because, you know, a lot of comic origins, you know, come from, from more lighthearted uh, sensibilities. So I, I think it's always important to kind of have that fun in there. Um, and these two characters really represent that. You know, refresh my recollection. Um, with this newest iteration of the DC Universe, um, Titans comes out next week with, uh, is it Tom? Um, Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor. Yeah. As Titans coming out, have you? Do you talk to Titan to, to, to Tom about you uh, know what you're doing with Cyborg in case he needs that for his Titans run? I think it's more our editors talking to each other because okay. they're the the keepers of the of the canon, so to speak. Um, so I, I don't know too much what he's doing uh, with Cyborg, but I I do think. There is a, I mean, you know, there's Nightwing is also going to have his ongoing as well. So right. and Batman has 5 million books. So it's just like, do these guys ever sleep, even though they're doing a bunch of things and a bunch of books. Um, but I do think that there's something, I could be wrong because I haven't read Titans one yet, but I do think there is something that at least sets up the, the notion that Vic might be coming in and out a little bit. I think you mentioned that something about uh, he's a boom tube, boom, boom tube away from yeah. Titan's Tower, right? Right. right. Where right. is Titan's Tower going to be? Do you it's know? in Bloodhaven now. They moved it to Bloodhaven with uh, in Nightwing City, which is pretty okay. dope. I think that's cool. Yeah. I I I, had, I thought I had read somewhere. I guess someone uh, some journalist uh, said that they thought the Titan's Tower is going to be moved to Detroit for some reason. I didn't. Oh. See. That'd be cool too. I mean, that'd be really convenient for cyborg. <laughs> All right, so he's going back and forth. Um, yeah. Now, the other thing I thought was was kind of cool. I, I I whited out the 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 dialogue because I didn't want to like give away your story. Yeah, but you know, you use this tool, this this blogger, right? Yeah. And you know, shout out to Tom Rainey. These visuals are kind of dope. Absolutely, he's he's got beautiful artwork. Um, you you've got this blogger and this this really this is I thought this was a great literary device mm -hmm. because it's a great way to have to move the story along, give background, set up what's going on in in, in sort of a larger scheme without having to use a bunch of pages because I know as you said you've only got six issues so you got to yeah. find creative ways to sort of move the story along and I thought this was a very creative way to do it good literary device Thank it you. reminded me of something Todd McFarlane used to do in Spawn all the time. Mm. Um, this, uh, this, this character that's introduced in this page, Marcus, right? Is that his name? Yeah. The guy on the, on the screen that she's talking into. The, yeah. The, the, the dumbass of the day. Yeah. The dumbass of the day. <laughs> what is, how significant a character is he going to be? Who is he and how significant will he I'd be? I'd say both of these characters are going to be super significant to the story. Um, Marcus is, uh, somewhat of an antagonist. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he is the, the CEO of this new company called Solace, which is like the uh, an amalgam of all the worst things you can possibly think of uh, with tech companies in, in real life. You know, it's a little bit of 23andMe. It's a little bit of um, 
like a meal a meal plan service. Basically, the idea is that they're going to take your DNA like you do with a 23andMe, and they put that through some algorithm and then figure out the best way to tailor your life for you so you don't ever have to make any decisions. Um, right. And he is the CEO and uh, guy who runs this company. And uh, he's a new character, but I, he does have a past with Victor specifically, which I'll get into in later issues. Um, and then the, the girl there, Estelle, is another character that I created. Um, she has this podcast that she does called Do Better Detroit. Um, and her whole her whole thing is that she is kind of a, a voice, a voice for me to kind of explore the issues that people have had with Cyborg in real life, like like people like me and you that are always clamoring for, to want more from the character. Right. But it contextualizes for, for, for her in, in, in the context of the story where it's just like, OK, Cyborg is back in Detroit, but like, what has he ever really done for Detroit? Like he got his superpowers and then he dipped. Right. So she doesn't really mess with him like like that. And she's always going in on him. Um, and I, the, the style pages are like some of my favorite pages to write because it's just fun to kind of roast the character. And then in the comment section, too, uh, I wrote all that stuff in there. And that's a lot of fun as well. Um, but I don't want to give too much away about her character, but uh, she's kind of an amalgam of two characters that exist in comics in general. I'll tell you one of them. Uh, is J. Jonah Jameson, and then the other one, you'll 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 see in later issues who she also is like. Uh, but for now, she's kind of a J. Jonah Jameson character. I think somebody said it was she was like Tasha K. <laughs> I can see that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things I think we mentioned a couple times is the relationship between uh, Victor and his father Silas, like. I, I just, I don't know. I, I've always had, that's the one aspect of Cyborg I always felt uncomfortable with mm -hmm. is the amount of animus that he's always had towards his father. Because as a father myself, you know, you think about a situation where, A, your kid's blown up and they're melting and they're about to die. You have seconds to save their life. Do you want to like think about it, ask them, hey, should I save your life by making you a cyborg or should I just let you die? Right. Like, I don't know of any parent that's going, or too many parents anyway, that's going to say, just let my kid die. Absolutely. Yeah. Most parents would be like, do whatever it takes to save my kid. Um, and, you know, I've always felt uncomfortable with the fact that, that, that Victor has such animus towards his father for saving his life. Like, it's one thing to say, my father has been distant with me my entire life, and now that I'm a cyborg, um, he just views me more as a, a lab experiment than a, than a person. I get that. Yeah. But the animus about you should not have saved my life. I I, I just view it as being somewhat ungrateful. You know. Sorry for that honking. My bad. I'm That's right okay. on a busy street. Um. So you, you, we have that scene here where obviously he's in his therapy session and he's still got some beef with his dad. Is this something that you're going to spend a lot of time with or have some resolution on finally? Can, can yeah. we finally get a, a resolution where he's like, you know what? Yeah. My dad's not a bad guy. Yeah. Um, yes. Short answer, yes. That's kind of the vision for the series, too, is is Cyborg is finally going to work through all these issues that he has. Uh, I, I don't you. know. I don't know if he's necessarily going to be on the side of my dad's not a bad guy by the end of the series, but he will accept what happened and accept his dad's decision. Um, and I think just to go off of what you were saying, because I, I wholeheartedly agree, uh, no parent would let their child die, especially if they had the means to save him, their, their child, especially with Silas, who has the particular means to be the brilliant scientist that he is and had all the resources that he had in front of him to his disposal to save his child. But going back to Vic's point of view, like you said, they already had this distance relationship Cyborg never really felt like he had the opportunity to pursue the things that he wanted in life because he his dad wanted him to be what he wanted him to be. And then ultimately his dad turned him into doing the kind of the right thing or the, the wrong thing for the right reasons, I guess, turning him into Cyborg to save his son. Um, but I think what Victor's point of view is, is I don't think he doesn't understand why his dad did what he did. He it's mad that he didn't have a choice. Yeah. And I think going back to some of the, the, uh, 
the earlier iterations of the character. I went back to new, the new Teen Titans Tales number one uh, from, from 1982 or whatever with Marv, Marv Wolfman and George Perez. And one, the first thing that Cyborg says to his father when he wakes up is, why didn't you let me die? Right. And I feel like that's super heavy, right? And I, I think ultimately that is what Cyborg, that's kind of what I've pinpointed as the crux of as Cyborg's issue is the power of choice and, and the idea that he has never really had a choice to do anything he's ever wanted to do in his entire life. Everything is predicated off of other people's choices. And that's what he's having a hard time navigate navigating and overcoming um so that's that's my point of view for if that makes sense yeah man I, I i love your take on it man I, i'm like even more excited to see what you're gonna write thank you <laughs> i'm really excited to see what you do with this character because i i honestly am a big fan of cyborg i, I think mm -hmm. he's just severely underrated you mentioned uh um reading that uh new teen titans number one it was created obviously by marv wolf and the great marv wolf and, and george Perez. may rest in peace um did you were you ever able to to talk to Marv Wolf at all or interact with him about this character? Yeah, um, not too much story wise, but you know they they did bring him on as like a mentor figure for the as I started working on this because like I said I've never done anything this big before. Yeah, um, but he was kind of like staunchly from the jump like that he didn't want to contribute to anything story wise, which I do appreciate. Um, yeah. He's always there to help out more logistically, like. Um, you know, because this is six issues, because you've got 20 issues, a, pay, uh, a, a book, that's not a lot of real estate. So, you know, he was he's always there being like, you know, you've got a lot of dialogue here. You've got too many panels on this page, stuff like that. Or And then he, he would steer me in the direction where it's just like, OK, this character is doing this, this this thing that Cyborg is reacting to. You know, he would always ask the question, like, would Cyborg react this way? Maybe you can think of it in a different way to contextualize that more on the page. So stuff like that. Um, and it's obviously very intimidating talking with Marv Wolfman, but he's a really nice guy. So, absolutely, I mean, the guy's a legend. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't want to give too much away because it's only the one issue that's out yeah. that's coming out uh, next week. Um, but we do get this ominous figure in this book. Um, without spoilers. Yeah. Um, what can you? Is 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 he going to be the big bad? Is going to be the antagonist? How significant is this character going to be? He is. This particular one is not the big bad, but he is at the heart of the journey that, that Vic is going to go through in this series, um, for better and for worse. But he is not the main antagonist. Okay. Yeah. What issue where we will we see the main antagonist? Um can you tell us that? I can. I just I'm still writing it. Like I'm not, I'm not, I haven't finished issue six yet. So Things are still a little bit in flux. Uh, I'd say three, issue three. Issue three. Is, well, we, we may not see the main antagonist, but we'll know who it is by issue three. All right. Yeah. Um, one of the things we talked about, one of the comments you made, actually, uh, when we talked about uh, Livewire and, and why you chose that as an antagonist for him, you said he, he doesn't really have a very large rogues gallery. So yeah, I, I, I went through some of his history and just pulled out characters in general. From his history and ask the question will they appear um, so let's start let's start from left to right we've yeah. got ron evers for those of you who may not be familiar ron evers was a childhood friend of uh cyborg his first appearances in tales of the new teen titans number one um R ron was uh a kid from the other side of the tracks you know uh, victor because of his parents uh, grew up in a very sheltered life. And Ron sort of represented uh, the type of life I think he kind of secretly more would have liked to have had. Mm -hmm. uh, but Ron was always in, in a trouble. And, and a long story short, uh, after Vic became cyborg, Ron also got some cybernetic enhancements in one story and basically became a cyborg 2.0. Any, any chance that he will pop up in your run? Um, I really wanted to use Ron, uh, but I couldn't make it fit with the six issues. So like I said, if I ever get another opportunity, he will be someone that I'm going to use because I think he's a great character and a great um, kind of opposite of Cyborg. I don't really know what version of him exists in, in this consolidation of the continuities right. we're in now. So I'm not sure if he is cybernetic like Cyborg anymore. 
Um, but I know at the very least, he's, he, he still would be that guy that was on the other side of the tracks. And I think that's really interesting to play with. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed if I ever get to do more, he would definitely be in the story. Uh, that is code, all of you out there, for buy the damn book. Absolutely, please. More importantly, <laughs> pre-order the book. <laughs> Pre-ordering the book gives the numbers to DC to say, you know what? People are so excited about Morgan's book. Let's give him another run or extend mm -hmm. his limited series to a full series. If you want that to happen, you got to pre-order the book. Don't just show up on LCS on, on Wednesday or Tuesday. It's DC book and buy the book off the shelf, that doesn't help. If you yeah. pre-order the book, DC looks at those numbers and says, you know what, they like Morgan's book. Maybe we should give him another contract and have him do some more. Yeah. All right, real talk. Appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, we would do that every time here at Black Comic Lords. Um, Sarah Sims, the other Sarah in Cyborg's life. Um, am I really pulling for her? Not really. <laughs> not really. That's the one he for like he forgot about, right? Yeah, everybody forgets. Yeah. She's irrelevant. I don't even know why she pops they, up. They, they had a whole relationship, and he forgot she existed. Pe yeah. pe people keep uh, various authors keep bringing her back. I don't know why. Yeah, he's got another Sarah. He's got Sarah Charles. They they portray her as the girl who actually likes him because Sarah like rebuffs him all the time. Right. Um. And, and, and uh, Sarah Charles always rebuffs him. But Sarah Sims always seems to have this thing where she actually likes him. Um, I don't care. I'm, yeah. I'm not particularly interested. But I wanted to know if you, you, you plan on bringing her back. Uh, sorry to that, Sarah, but she will not be in my series. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So moving on. Phantom Limbs. This was kind of a, a, a cool concept in terms mm -hmm. of kind of creating... A, a real rogues gallery for Vic, yeah. Uh, because they, it's basically kind of a, a, a former veterans who were all injured in, in in various armed services and various wars, and they they much like your theme we talked about, you know, with um, Victor sort of representing sort of this disabled yeah. sort of superhero, you know, being an icon for that. Um, these are soldiers who were disabled from war got cybernetic enhancements and became like a super squad. Mm -hmm. um, first appearance DC special cyborg number five. I always thought they were kind of a unique set that should come back. Any any possibility for that? Uh, Phantom Limbs is not in my series. That is all right. Next time we're gonna pre-order your book. So that like I said, if if I, if I ever get more than six, like in, in in if there's an ongoing situation, like there's just so much room to do other things. Okay. You know? But yeah. Unfortunately, he's not in my my series. The closest guy I've had to another guy who I thought was was kind of a somewhat nemesis, for lack of a better term, Elias Orr, who's this mercenary guy, who just is kind of a thorn Vic side, just always trying to set him up to work for some nefarious organization. Never really find out who he works for. You kind of figure it's kind of a, a government, quasi corporate, shadow government type group. Who wants to use Vic's cybernetics for ill-gotten gains? Um, any possibility of him showing up? No. Nope. Sorry. All right. Sorry, Elias. That's all right. <laughs> Last one. The Cyborg Revenge Squad. <laughs> just on name recognition alone. Yeah. I just love the side. Literally, I'm not making this up. It's, no, it's funny. It's hilarious. They were literally called the Cyborg Revenge Squad. Like I for what? Out like, like how do you have this this much animosity towards Cyborg? I think that's really funny. Um, Never really explained why they had this animus towards him. Not they at just all. Show yeah. up. Um, we're from a, we're from the future. We're and from Ron is one of them, right? Huh? Ron Evers is one of them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ron Evers. That's him in the you know. The anti cyborg squad, it's just it yeah. was kind of a crazy concept. Yeah, um, this is one of those that I ask you, are they going to show up and really kind of really say, plead with you, please don't let them show up? Yeah, well, actually, I, I don't tell me I, they show up when I went on like Comic Vine to, to, to just kind of do the same thing you did and figure out who I can pull from. That's where I mean, I knew about obviously Mammoth and Gizmo from the Teen Titans show, but I'm just like, okay, well, at least in the comics, there's, there's a little bit of precedent that these these dudes don't mess with Cyborg for whatever reason. So I pulled specifically Mam Mammoth and Gizmo from like this image, I think, off of like Comic Vine. Um, 
But who else is in there? Ron Evers is not going to show up. Um, I don't know the uh, rest. Giz, Giz, isn't that Gizmo down there? Yeah, Gizmo and Mammoth do. And like I said, they're going to yeah. come up again in later issues. But Oh, and there was the 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 woman version of Cyborg who's like, oh, yeah. I am a more badass version of Cyborg than you are. That's my claim to fame. Yeah, no, she's not going to show up. Yeah, all right. That's that's I'm not losing any sleep over that one. <laughs> um, so we talked about uh pre ordering your comics, everyone. Um, if you if you're a fan of Cyborg, if you like what you've heard from Morgan and what he has planned for this character, please, please, the book comes out next week. Fine, you can still pre order issue two, issue three, issue four, five, and six. You should put yeah. it on your pull list. Go to your LCS and say, I want a subscription. Put it on my pull list. Yeah, and that if they sell help. out, that's a really good thing. Too. And if they sell out, if you can get this man a second print. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome, right? Um, um, you guys can make it happen. Don't don't complain in our space saying, oh, uh, I, I wish you know that DC never supports these characters and doesn't give them more books. They're giving them an opportunity and give you opportunity to, to, to support them. And make another series, but you got to buy the book. You got to pre-order the book. So please do that. Um, where was I? Uh, give me one second. I need Tamiko's help to pull this off. Ah, here I figured it out. There we go. All right, I'm not completely incompetent. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you what other projects you got going on. Um, nothing I can talk about. Nothing you can talk about. Every uh, single creator I bring on the show says the same damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, we sign those things, and until stuff's announced, we can't say anything. Um, I am in grad school, too, so if you want to consider that a project, um, I'm always writing pilots and stuff at school. So, Because the, the dream is that I can get to write TV and films and comic books. So, yeah. Um, if there was... Let's say you're sitting down at Comic-Con, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got all the major publishers, Marvel, DC, Indies, whatever. Um, and you and they all come to you and go, Morgan, we dig what you did on, on Cyborg. We want to offer you the opportunity to write whatever character you want for us. Give me your top five characters mm -hmm. that you would like to write stories on. Top five. Um, well going back to the theme of what I've been saying the past 20 minutes, I'd be like, give me more Cyborg, because I would love to write Cyborg forever. Um, I feel like they're all going to be DC, because I, I, I'm i a DC guy, not that I don't like Marvel, but I'm like so out of the loop with Marvel, so I've, I would feel it would feel kind of disingenuous to be like, give me this character, because there's so much research I would have to do, because I've been so out of the loop. Um, so I'd say Green Lantern, John Stewart, I like that guy a lot. Um, I like kind of his also consolidated history of, of, of being a Marine, but also like an artist. Um, I, my dad was a Marine, so I feel like I could have some cool conversations and, and get some insight with that. Um, any of the flashes, I think they're all dope. Um, also anything milestone. Like, like, like I said, we, we have that, that uh, DC new talent showcase that's coming out early next month and we're all wrote milestone stories for that. Oh, I wanted to ask you about that. What, what, yeah. what are, are you going to be involved in that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're all the milestone. They paired us up from the milestone initiative, and they, they what, gave us what book stories. are what story are you going to be writing on? I'm okay. doing a rocket story. In a rocket story. Yeah. Um, all right. Which I think we all because they they let us pitch for those. Um, they I think we all pitched static because that's what we all wanted to write. Yeah. But we all gave them a bunch of pitches, and then they chose which ones they wanted us to do. Um, not that I didn't want to do Rocket because obviously she was one of my pitches, but I like really got to know Rocket a lot like just i feel like on a personal level so it was yeah. really fun to, to write that story and now she's one of my favorite characters and you'll see like i said this was actually the first thing i ever wrote um for for dc you'll see kind of like some of the stuff i was working through and figuring out ends up kind of being in cyborg too not from like a plot standpoint but like some of the more comic book logistical stuff that i do um is kind of in both of those when it's kind of really cool to see those two things juxtaposed. Um, but yeah, anything milestone, I would love, that would be a major dream 
Tim. It's funny you mentioned Rocket. We actually got to interview uh, Tamiko and I got to interview uh, Stephanie. Uh, oh yeah, Williams and um, um, uh, oh wow, Yasmin Flores. Yeah, Yasmin, yeah. Yasmin was in um, the Monster Initiative too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, about their their Icon and Rocket story. Mm -hmm. Um, and you kind of got a glimpse of the future. Uh, is is your Rocket going to take place in the current? Milestone universe or that continuation of that future one? It's the current. Um, they kind of gave us like almost free reign to do whatever we wanted, which was cool. Yeah. Um, but it's it's to my knowledge that everything is in the same continuity. Um, uh, because they definitely did like when we would do stuff that didn't fit with what they're doing in the milestone comics, they were like, Yeah, you can't do that, or you can't use that character. But um, yeah, it, it, to my knowledge, it's in the same regular main continuity. So somebody wrote here. They just brought back Bloodwind. Would you ever be interested to write anything for him? I just found out about Bloodwind like Wait, two months ago. when do they bring back Bloodwind? Did I miss this? <laughs> what issue was that? I didn't know. Yeah. My roommate talks about Bloodwind all the time. He's a big Bloodwind guy. I didn't no, know Bloodwind's that, Blood Wind's that dude. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, look, I'll do anything. If they're like, hey, we want you to tell the story. We like how you write. I'll write any character. Um, I, and I do like the research aspect of. I, I need to know, or Boris. I need to know what comic Bloodwind is in. I didn't know he was back. I haven't seen him in a minute. It's just nice. it just got announced for a book in August. That's cool. What? How did yeah, I not I mean, know that? I'm so that embarrassed. Oh, Steel's a good one too. I like Steel. Shout out to yeah. my friend Dorado Quick, also from the Milestone Initiative. He's doing um. Three steel stories in uh, action. Steel works comes and out still, uh, yeah, with Michael Dorn. next few weeks, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we were talking about Rocket. Uh, I'd be remiss. Uh, my fellow Black Comic Lord Tamiko is a huge Rocket fan. I'm sure she probably has a question about that. I know we're limited on time. Let her ask a question. I'm sure she has a question, and she'll probably yell at me if I don't allow it. <laughs> oh, you're on. The mic's off. There you go. Actually, I did not have a question. <laughs> All right, well, well, get out of here. Today, I'm ready for it. Give it to me. I'm, I'm cool. Ready. Comes out June 6th, so yeah, I'm excited for it too. Pre-order it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Morgan. You know, one of the things we like to do, Morgan, is after you do an interview with us, and we're your first interview, so I'm, I'm kind of yeah. somewhat proud of that. Um, we like to ask people to, to do a clip for us where they say, their name and say, I'm a black comic lord. Because once you interview with us, you're a member of the family, I'd like to have you join the clique. Cool. Yeah. No, for sure. I'll do that. So let me, let me back out here and you go ahead and do that. Hold okay. On. Let's figure this out. At least this technology. Uh, my name is Morgan Hampton and I am a black comic lord. Excellent. Welcome to the fan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So, um, just a reminder to everyone, make sure you do your pre-orders. Uh, we have, uh, recurring lives, um, periodically, usually on Fridays. I have my Wakanda whiskey and blurred them happy hour, late night happy hour with my boy Mark, where we drink good whiskey and chop it up about T'Challa, Wakanda, and the other, the other thing in the Blurred Them universe that comes across our whiskey adult minds. Um, we also have uh, Real Talk with Rich, usually on Sundays, where uh, Real uh, Rich talks OG Richard the Panther Hearted, goes in about whatever's crossing his mind, and it's always interesting. And then finally, uh, every month we've got our Black Comic Lords ladies do their live and talk about various topics, uh, hardcore comics dives. Um, we have a lot of recent specials that are on our website, that are on our YouTube channel here at Black Comic Lords. Please check them out. Like, subscribe, share, hit the notification button so you know about other uh, videos that come up in the future. And... Uh, you know, we got a little monetization little thing, a little dollar sign. Anybody wants to drop a little change, a dollar or two, every little bit helps us to keep the lights on and have all these cool special effects. Um, 
Thank you, Frustrated Fan. Greatly appreciate you as well. Um, thank you all for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. Morgan, thank you very much for coming out with us. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Tamiko, you can take us out.